Okay, so we're talking, we're still talking about reactions of alkenes, and so on Friday, we talked about hydroboration oxidation as well as the mercuration, demercuration that we're going to continue, but I'm going to um, put it in another reaction that's very similar. So what we were doing with mercuration, demercuration is we were reacting the double bond with mercury acetate and water. And so in that reaction, basically the mercury with one acetate on it is going to be our electrophile. So it's going to act like H+. Plus. And then the water is going to add like water. So this reaction is, is essentially going to be mercury plus and then the water. So whenever we add an electrophile first, it's always going to follow Markovnikov's addition. Because we have to add that E plus or H plus to the double bond that has the most hydrogens to get the most stable double bond. Or sorry, to get the most stable carbocation. Now in this case what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is to show the stereochemistry of this reaction. Because when we went through this on Friday, in the end, if you had truly had a carbocation, the mercury and the water would add 50-50 cis and trans, just like H plus H2O did last Wednesday or Monday. So in this case our first compound that we're going to make will be adding the mercury acetate and the water they will end up adding trans. Is what we find. And then when you go ahead and you replace the mercury acetate by using the sodium borohydride, that replaces the mercury with an H in exactly the same position that the mercury was in. And so my final product would be having the H and the OH would, would add Markovnikov. But in this case, what I'm showing you is that if you add it, if you did this reaction, you would end up with 100% trans addition of the H and the OH across the double bond. Now, this double bond doesn't have Markovnikov or anti Markovnikov because, number one, it's symmetrical so that when you add the H plus H2O or when you add E plus and a nucleophile, it doesn't matter which way you add because you're going to end up with the same product. Plus it wouldn't have Markovnikov anyway because the carbons in the double bond have the same number of hydrogens, zero. So in that case we would add them both ways, but since this is a symmetrical alkene, it won't be um, Markovnikov. And that, we're going to talk about that when we talk about regio and stereo selectivity. Okay, but first we need to get a bunch of reactions down so that we can go back and talk about that. Okay. So if this was truly a carbocation intermediate, we would get 50-50 addition. And it's not. Because what will happen is that the mercury is big enough that the mercury would actually sit over both of the carbons in the double bond. And so it forms a triangular intermediate. And so then what that does is that splits up the positive charge and lets it be shared between the two carbons that were in the double bond. 
So it's, that's what's called delocalization. The water then will come in and add from opposite of where the triangle is. So if the mercury in this case is above the plane of the ring, the water would add from below, or if the mercury is below the plane of the ring, the water will add from above. So that's what sets up the stereochemistry over here of adding the mercury and the water trans is because of the triangle, because they're triangular intermediate. And this is not the first triangular intermediate that we'll see, because we need to be able to interpret our, our um, regioselectivity, meaning is it Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? We need to interpret that with the triangle, since the triangle is the real species that's being formed. And again, how do I know that? Because when I do this reaction, I end up with 100% trans. If there was a true carbocation formed, it would be 50-50, and it's not. Okay. Right? Does that kind of make sense? So, I, the mercury is probably not the best example to look at the triangle with. So, let's go on to the next reaction, which is almost, bless you, it's almost the same. So, we'll start out with first and I've been using this as our, our example. Let's go ahead and add bromine to a double bond. This is going to be called bromination. So bromination, we're going to add Br2 to the double bond. And so I'm going to have a bromine, bromine bond, which is what makes up Br2. Now you might say, what is our electrophile here? Because the Br2 being a diatomic um, molecule doesn't have a delta plus or a delta minus. And that's true, but when the bromine comes down and gets close to the double bond, the pi bond, then what happens is these bromines start to polarize. So when the bromine comes down close to the pi bond, it becomes slightly positive and the other bromine becomes slightly negative because basically one of the bromines is sitting close to the to the pi bond to the electrons there. The easiest way to write this though with arrows is I'm going to take this pair of electrons to form the carbon bromine bond and I'm going to break the bromine bromine bond. So the way we normally write this mechanism and this is a mechanism that you will have to write not transition states but just intermediates is to take the double bond and have it attack one of the bromines and have the other bromine leave as a Br minus. So what would happen then is that I would have my CH3, CH2. I could add the bromine to the carbon 1, which would leave a carbocation there, plus Br minus. Or I could have the other product being formed where I would add the Br to the second carbon, leaving the first carbon as a carbocation. So again, A and B I could form by the addition of bromine to B or by the, bro the addition of bromine to A. And so in this case, where is that bromine going to add? Is it going to add to carbon A or carbon B? I'm wondering if we shouldn't vote. So let's vote. Where would the where's the bromine? Which of these two which is these two is going to form? A or B? I suppose you can have C, meaning they're going to form equally.
Okay, we ready? A, B, C would be both equally. I've got 21 B's. 21 B's and three A's. Three A's. What's the problem with A? It's a primary carbocation. Do we write primary carbocations? Not and expect to get points. Right? Because that's what it's all about, is getting points. So we're going to form B. And if you're like, didn't we do this on Friday? Yeah. Didn't we do this last Wednesday? Yeah. So I'm going to form B. And then what's going to happen with B? What's going to happen with B is that that secondary carbocation, the Br minus, is going to come in and add to that carbocation to form the dibromide. And this is what is called a vicinal dibromide is the technical term. So vicinal means next to each other. So the two bromines are attached to adjacent carbons. Vicinal basically means this would be a 1,2 dibromide. 1 and 2 being, well, in this case, that's the actual numbering scheme for the IUPAC chain, but 1, 2 just means relative to each other. Okay. So in essence, what I did in this reaction was I added a Br plus and followed by a Br minus. Okay. So if I'm adding this to my list of reactions, which I am, I would now say, okay, we're going to add Br2. What am I adding to the double bond? Two. Net result is I'm adding what to the double bond? Two Brs. So when we add Br2, what am I adding? I'm adding two BRs. How am I adding it? Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? In what sense? Markovnikov in in what sense? Whoever said that? Because I'm adding a Br plus. So adding a Br plus is like adding an H plus or generically an E plus, an electrophile. So it is Markovnikov addition, but in the end, how do I know that? I don't because I added two Brs. Now, if I could add Br and something else, then I would end up with Markovnikov addition. So in this case, the answer is neither. I'm adding neither Markovnikov nor anti-Markovnikov because I'm adding two BRs. And in the end, I can't tell which BR added to which carbon. Give me a minute, and we'll be, we'll be able to tell that. Okay. And then, what's the stereochemistry of the addition? Well, it turns out that the stereochemistry of the addition is 100% trans. And again, what I'm showing you here is I'm showing the, you the idea that if we're looking at this, this is, how I, this is how I judge that I added the Br to the first carbon 
and then added the Br minus to the second carbon. If this was really the mechanism, if this was a true full-blown carbocation here, then when I add the two bromines, I should be adding them 50-50. And what I find is that when I translate this over to a cyclohexane ring, which I'm going to do now, if I say, well, let's just take cyclohexane and let's add Br2 to it, the final product actually is that I add two BRs. There's no Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, but if I did this reaction, what I would end up doing is showing that I added the two BRs 100% trans. There is no 50-50, there is no cis. So this reaction goes 100% trans. So what does that mean? That means that the carbocation is not a true carbocation. How do I get 100% trans? How did I get 100% trans with the mercury? I ended up forming the triangle. And so in this case, that's exactly what's going to happen with this bromine. The bromine is large enough that it's going to sit on top of the double bond and be simultaneously bonded, partially bonded, to each of the two carbons in the double bond. That means that instead of one carbon getting the positive charge, both carbons are going to, get a are going to share in the positive charge. So I'm going to end up with two delta positives attached to that bromine. So the stability there is because those two carbons now will share the positive charge. Nobody has to take on the brunt of the positive one themselves. But the result is that as the bromine sits in a triangle, the second bromine has to come in and add from the opposite side so that I get 100% trans addition of the two BRs. Okay. Okay. So mechanistically, what's happening is, is that if you do these reactions and you find you get a 50-50 mixture by the additions, if you get 50% cis, 50% trans, you know you have a full-blown carbocation because it has to add 50-50 just like SN1. But if you find that you get 100% trans addition, then what's happening is that that electrophile is sitting over both carbons, making the triangle so that the nucleophile has to add 100% from underneath. And so that's how we can tell the difference in the mechanism by looking at the final product. Does that make sense? So bromination is two BRs. It's neither Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. 100% trans. Okay. So it's, this is similar to what happens with mercuration, except now what I would like to do is put the triangle in the context of Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov. But to do that, I need to add something other than a second BR. So let's do this. Let's say that we have this double bond. And I'm going to add BR2 and water to this. So what I do is I put bromine in water. It's called bromine water. And what will happen is water certainly is not an electrophile. So the double bond is still going to react with the two BRs. And so this pair of electrons is going to go to, for, to form the carbon bromine bond and kick off the BR minus. Now, in reality, what happens is I'm going to end up with my, with my triangle. I'm going to end up with the bromine partially bonded 
to each of the two carbons. And what really happens in this reaction is the two bromines come and they get close to the pair of electrons on the carbon. So if I have my carbon-carbon double bond here and I have my pi bond, when the first, when the bromines come together, when they together come down close to the pi bond, this bromine becomes polarized delta plus and that bromine becomes polarized delta minus. Because when a bromine sits in the field of the pi bond, it's going to adopt a charge of slightly positive. The other bromine that's not close to the pi bond is going to become slightly negative. And then ultimately that bromine is going to leave. But when you do this reaction with bromine and water, what happens is when you break the bromine-bromine bond, the Br- is up here. And there's water molecules that are sitting right underneath that are going to be adding. So when you add Br2 and water, yes, you add a Br+, plus, but by the time the Br- minus would get all the way around the molecule, the water's already added. So the minute I form this, this carbocation with my delta positive charge here and my delta positive charge there, my water, I already have a water since it's a solvent, it's sitting there ready to add. So the Br minus isn't going to add, the water is. So I've just modified this reaction, so now I'm going to add two things, a Br plus and water. And of course the water is going to come in and add, form an oxonium ion, lose the H plus, and I'm going to get an OH group. My question is, where does the water add? Does it add to carbon A? Does it add to carbon B? Or does it add C to both of them? Where's the, where's the water going to add? A, B, or C would be both, or D would be, don't know. We have a 12 to 9 vote. So, you know what that means? That means we're going to take a minute. You're going to discuss. We're going to re-vote. We're going to see if anybody changed anybody's minds or you decided to change your mind. So go ahead and discuss. Where's water going to add, A, B, or C? Okay, we ready to vote? Okay, let's re-vote. A, 
A, B, C would be both, D would be don't know. Twenty four, twenty four to zero. There aren't there supposed to be twenty nine people in here? For the five of you that are not here right now watching this, shame. Uh, twenty four zero. What was it? Twenty four zero A. Why? Since everybody answered twenty, answered A, then you're not disclosing anything. If you give me a reason why, why, why did you decide that water's going to add to A? Ty. So that's Markovnikov's rule. So in other words, this reaction is going to go by Markovnikov's rule, which is true. The Br is going to end up on the carbon with the most hydrogens, and the water is going to end up adding to the carbon with the least number of hydrogens, which is true. It is going to add to A. So before what we did was when we wrote out the Br adding to carbon um, A or carbon B, I know this is a different molecule, but what we ended up doing is if we wrote the true carbocation forms, where's, in this case, where would the water add? The water would have to add on the most stable carbocation. But what I'm doing now is I'm not doing this reaction in terms of Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov as a true carbocation, what I've now done is I've translated it to the triangle. So that's exactly what's going to happen, but now I have to explain why does the water attack carbon A in the triangular intermediate. Because that's where it's going to go. But why is, why, what's my explanation now that it's in the triangle? Is anybody questioning their, their decision about A? And wanna, I'll propose B. I think water is going to add to B because B is less sterically hindered. Anybody going with me on that answer? Is it logical? Does it make sense? It makes sense, but I thought you just said that it added to A, which it does. So let's walk through this. You're the water. What kind of nucleophile are you? Strong or weak? Weak. You are a weak nucleophile as water. What kind of reaction can you undergo, SN1 or SN2? Water can only undergo what kind of reaction? SN1. Why? Because you're weak and you need, you're, you're just barely electron rich, and so you have to give to the poorest of the poor. You need to react with a very strong electrophile, which is really electron poor. So strong or weak nucleophiles can only react with carbocations. Okay. 
Now, what kind of carbocation would you react with? It's going to depend on the type of carbocation I have. So the rule is, if you're electron rich, you've got to give to the poorest of the electron poor. So which of these two carbons, carbon A or carbon B, has the greatest delta positive charge? Which one has the greatest delta positive charge? A? There's no fun here because we already know it's adding to A, right? So it's like, okay, yeah, it's going to add to A, but why, why does A have the most positive charge. What is, if I made a true carbocation out of A, what kind would it be? And I know when I say what kind, you're like, what do you mean? Primary, secondary, tertiary. What does A look like? What kind of carbocation would A look like? Tertiary. And I'm going to put quotes around tertiary because it's really not, but it looks like one. What kind of carbocation does B look like? primary. So if I'm looking at those two carbons, A looks more like a tertiary carbocation and B looks more like a primary carbocation. Who's going to be able to handle the greatest delta positive charge? The tertiary. So what happens in this case is the following. Water is a weak nucleophile. It must react with, with the carbon with the greatest positive charge. That's SN1-like. Okay, It's not SN1 really, but it's SN1-like. Because now I've got to put everything in the context of the triangle. Because that's what forms. If it was a true carbocation, I would get 50-50. I'm not. So it's got to be in the context of the triangle. So the water then has to react with the carbon with the most delta positive charge. Which one is that going to be? That's going to be the carbon in the triangle that is most substituted. Which in this case is A. The, the, re, the, two meth, the two methyl groups is the reason why, the, why A can have a positive charge. Is because, they're, yes, they're going to push some electron density in, but that's going to stabilize whatever positive charge is there. Carbon B has no, has absolutely no positive charge on it whatsoever. It just can't handle it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. Also, the steric hindrance thing is kind of counterintuitive, but I'll let me come to back to that. So, yes, the carbon, this carbon with the two other methyl groups, the methyl groups are what are, is allowing this carbon to be delta positive to begin with. With no, with just hydrogens, that carbon can't take on much positive charge at all relative to those two. This one can be stabilized. It's going to take on the positive charge. The other carbon is not. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? We know what the answer, we knew what the answer was. Because if we did this reaction looking at which way the bromine in water adds, we know the bromine has to add to the carbon 
with the most hydrogens because that's going to make the most stable carbocation. All I'm doing is putting it in the context of the triangle because the triangle is actually what reacts, not the individual carbocations. So we have to say, well, why would the water want to add to the carbon A? Because carbon A has the greatest delta positive charge. And by definition, a weak nucleophile must react with the carbon with the positive, with the greatest positive charge. What role do steric hindrance have? None. Now, we're going to come back to triangles where steric hindrance will play a role, but not now. Does kind of make sense? So let me let's see. Let me show you what that intermediate really looks like. Okay. So in the grand scheme of things, I'd hope to have this actually in have models of this. But if we do some computer calculations on the bromonium ion, this is what we find happening. So I'm going to add bromine to my, to my double bond to make my bromonium ion. The molecule on the left has two methyl groups. So both of those are secondary. So the bromine is actually sits in the middle of those two because they're both going to be secondary carbocations in the triangle. The one on the right is the one that we're doing with the two methyl groups on one side and the two hydrogens on the other. So actually, if you look at this, the one, in the, the one here, you can see that the bromine is sitting perfectly over those two carbons. That's because both of those carbons share equally in the positive charge. And so there's no unequal sort of sharing. An unequal sharing would mean that the bromine shifts to one side or the other. That's not the case in the one on the left. Okay. So then the one on the right, how is it different? Well, if we kind of look at it, you can see that in this case, if I stop this, the bromine is actually sitting on one carbon. It's sitting on, I don't know if this will work. Yeah. See, the bromine is sitting right here on this carbon, and it's far, far away from this carbon. Now, this is the carbon with the two methyl groups. Notice that the three groups here are basically trigonal planar. What does that mean? That means this is really kind of like a true carbocation. But the bromine is still partially bonded to it. But this bromine, this carbon is okay. It can handle the positive charge. It doesn't need the bromine sitting on top of it to take care of the positive charge. This carbon, this primary carbon, isn't as lucky. And so what happens is the bromine kind of slides over to this one. It's not truly tetrahedral. The bromine is still partially bonded to both of these, so that the nucleophile is going to add, have to add from underneath. But in this case, it shows that this carbon, if that carbon could handle a lot of positive charge, the bromine wouldn't be, need to be there. But the fact that it can't handle a lot of positive charge, the bromine has to be there. The other one can definitely handle that. Now, what we do is we write the delta positive charges. We kind of write the bromine over both of them. That's not totally correct. It would look more like that. 
So that kind of shows the reality of the situation. This carbon has more positive charge on it. This is more carbocation-like. This is less carbocation-like. But the bromine still has to be bonded to both of them in order to get 100% trans fission. So that's that's looking at it, and this is this is a a talk I've given numerous places, including to I didn't talk about this with the high school kids because high school kids should know about bromonium ions, but I I think I this is the one for, this is a talk I gave from D at Dayton last spring on on virtual reality, not on. But in the real world, what I, what I had hoped to was by the time we talked about this, I'd actually hoped to have the 3D, mo the 3D printer in my office hooked up so I could print out these two 3D models and you could see them. I'm a little behind schedule on that. But that's how we can actually tell that this carbon has more delta positive charge on it. So where is the water going to add? Or where is any nucleophile going to add? Underneath for 100% trans. And it's going to add to the carbon that is most substituted because that will be the carbon with the greatest positive charge. Okay. So that's how we put this in the context of the triangle. We have to because it's 100% trans. Right. Is everybody kind of with me? All right, let's do this reaction with the, with the cyclohexene, with the ring, because that will be where we show 100% trans. So I'm going to add Br2 and water to this. My first step in the mechanism is going to have the pair of electrons react with the br bromine, kick the other bromine off to form a Br minus. That's going to form this bromonium ion where there's delta positive charge as on both carbons. Now in this case, it's a secondary versus tertiary. It's going to be a little bit more equitable, but not completely. And so now I form my bromonium ion. My water is going to come in, and which carbon is it going to add to? The carbon on the, the top or the carbon on the bottom? The water is going to add to the carbon that is most substituted, which is the carbon that is on the top. So the water is going to come in and add here. That bromine then in the triangle is going to slide over so that I end up with adding, I'll say I added the water from underneath. So now I have my oxonium ion. And my bromine then must be trans to the water that just added, so it's going to be on a bold wedge. Then I'm going to take my oxonium ion, give my pair of electrons to the oxygen, so I'm going to end up forming an H+, and now have added the OH and the Br. 100% trans and also now in this case since the BR was the electrophile and it added to the carbon with the most hydrogens in the double bond this is now been, that BR and the OH have been added 100% trans and they've also been added Markovnikov addition because the electrophile added to the carbon with the most hydrogens, the nucleophile added to the other carbon that's most substituted. Okay. So in this case, I have both 
100% trans and Markovnikov edition. Does that kind of make sense? So this is what is called a, a bromohydrin. That's its name. So now we have the addition of Br2 and H2O. Going through our three questions, what am I going to add? Net, a Br, and an OH. How am I adding them? I'm going to take the broader position here of Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov. Okay, and, and let me just go through that to make sure we're all clear on what I mean by that. So when we started this, which was only last week, right? seems a lot longer. What we said was when we added our H plus and our Cl minus, the Markovnikov addition meant that we added the hydrogen to the carbon with the most hydrogens in the double bond, and we added the Cl minus to the carbon that was most substituted, had the least number of hydrogens. That's what we called Markovnikov addition. I'm going to broaden that out and say, you know what, the H plus was an electrophile. The chloride was a nucleophile. So now what I'm going to say is that when you add the electrophile to the carbon with the most hydrogens, and you add the nucleophile to the carbon that is most substituted, that is going to be Markovnikov addition. So I'm going to so I'm going to expand Markovnikov's rule so that other electrophiles can substitute for H+. Well, what other electrophiles have we done? The other electrophiles would be things like the mercury acetate had a positive charge and the Br plus had a positive charge, along with the H plus. So when those groups add to the carbon with the most hydrogens, it is Markovnikov addition. So that means if I go back to this reaction, I'm adding Br and OH, I'm adding basically a Br plus and an OH minus. I know I'm not adding OH minus, I'm adding water, but net result, this is mark, going to be my Markovnikov addition, 100% trans. Okay. So those are my three rules, or three questions, the answers to the three questions for this reaction. So now what we need to do on Wednesday, and the book has interspersed this idea of regio and stereoselectivity. Okay, so now that we have some reactions to work with, now what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, first of all, what does it mean to be regioselective or stereoselective? And then how do we apply that to these reactions? And so we're going to do regio and stereoselective on Wednesday along with, I'm, for some reason, I think there's another reaction that was in with today that we didn't do. But we still have anti-Markovnikov HBR addition, which is a free radical mechanism. And there's a couple other things, I think, for double bonds that we need to talk about. We're actually... We're going to, once we're done with this chapter, we're going to go into free radical halogenation, which I had at the end. We're probably not going to make it to alkynes. So I think Dr. Kwan, I don't know, he convinced me sort of to, to kind of not go into alkynes, but 
So we won't make it through all the material that I have listed, which means we'll start going through this. And I think the exam is after Thanksgiving. But we need to we need to talk more about these, including doing some problems and integrating some SN1 type stuff, E1 back into it. Okay. Okay. Um, if you watch your graded assignments, you.